Hi there, everybody. Um, okay, I think it's recording now. Okay, so we are right at the very end. We've uh, done all our courses, and now it's time to start with the assignment. So what this is, is basically just a read-through of the assignment um, to hopefully clarify some issues that you guys might have, some stuff that you're unsure about, and just to point out one or two things. So I'm just going to share the assignment with you guys. Right, there we go. So let's start and get straight into it. So on the assignment, you'll see it says the assignment consists of five questions. So very simple. You have to attempt all five questions. So you don't have a choice on which ones you want to do. And the chances, if you don't do any one, um, chances of passing it is not a lot. So I have in the past had a few guys who simply forget or don't miss, or miss look at a question and then they fail because they didn't attempt all. So make sure you do attempt all five questions. Okay, all are compulsory needs to be answered in full. Okay, compile your answers neatly, preferably making use of spreadsheet software such as Excel. Okay, so a lot of you guys are also good with Word. Regardless which one you use, um, you have to convert it into a PDF. So that's one of my notes there. Make sure that because we can't mark Excel sheets, we can't mark Word documents. So you have to submit in a PDF format. So you've got a PDF print. And then also if there's uh, declaration forms that you have to do, plagiarism declarations and so forth, make sure you scan everything into one PDF because only the one. So if you've got five answers and it's five separate PDF documents, combine all of them into one PDF because only one document gets submitted to us. So if you have five separate documents for each question and you upload five separate ones, only the last one is going to show on our side. Okay. Then it's 100 marks. Okay, very important. Where there's T accounts, in order to obtain your mark for that T account, you should have the following. It should appear under the correct name. It should be allocated to the correct debit or credit side. The date has to be correct and the random amount has to be correct. Okay, this is very important. So you'll see there, it says if any of these aspects are incorrect, no mark will be avoided. Awarded. So a lot of guys will do it correctly, but they forget to enter dates. So if you don't put the date that you get the debit and the credit right, but there's no date, it's zero for that um, for that line and basically for that whole question. Then. So make sure all four of those aspects have to be there. Okay, and then where that is applicable, that rate should be 15%. Okay. So let's get into question one. I'm just going to get mine closer by. I've made some notes here. Okay. So let's first start with the required. That's normally the best place because then we know what we're looking for. So we're looking for a supplementary cash book and we are looking for a bank reconciliation. So this is exactly like the example that we did um, when we did the lecture on bank recons. Okay, it says your business cash book balance on 31 October 2022 reflected a balance of 22,000 Rand. Okay, that is an error. This is important that you get this. That value should be 50,000 Rand. So that value there, 22,000 Rand, should be 50,000 Rand. Okay, so please change that on your assignments, otherwise, it's not going to balance. Okay. So with that amount, we can immediately immediately go and put into our set of accounts. And then also the bank statement balance of 15,000 on the same date. So that we can also go and put into our bank reconciliation. Okay. Then it says a comparison of the cash book and the bank statement of October reveals the following. Okay, so just before we start, just remember the golden rule. So if a transaction did happen, so they say it's on the bank statement, then normally we have to go and add it to our cash book because we didn't know about it. If something will happen in future, so there's transactions in my cash book that hasn't yet passed the bank statement, but it will, then it's going to be bank reconciliation. So I'm going to read through this. I'm going to try and guide you guys without actually giving the answer. Okay. So interest earned of 3,900 Rand on the favorable bank balance has not been entered into the cash book, okay? 
So ask yourself, did it happen or will it still happen? The answer is it did happen. So then you can decide how you're going to handle that. Okay, then a deposit of 38,360 has been incorrectly entered into the cash book as 38,630. Okay, so obviously we made the error. So remember, go back to the lecture. If we made the error, where do we fix it? And then whether you reverse the full transaction and repeat the correct one, or you just post the difference, both will be marked correct. There's not an issue with that. Okay. A deposit of 11,000 Rand made on 28th October has not yet reflected on the bank statement. Okay. So my note there is you can assume that it will still go through. There's no indication that that was a false deposit. So we've got it on the cash book. It's not read on the bank statement, but you can assume that it will still happen in future. An EFT of 45,000 from a client has not been entered in the cash book. Okay, so I can tell you that transaction did happen. So it means that it did physically come into the bank. We didn't know about it on our cash book. So where are we going to fix that? A debit order in favor of ABSA for 28,086 Rand appears on the bank statement only. So again, did it happen? Yes, it did happen. So where are you going to fix that? Bank charges amounting to 2150 were debited in your bank account. So again, did that happen? Yes, the bank charges went off your bank statement. I don't have them in my cash book. So we'll have to go and add it. Then number seven, a EFT payment to a client for 14,000 Rand on the 31st of October, scheduled for payment on the 31st of October, only appears in the cash book, okay? So given that it's the same day, that transaction will probably reflect on the bank statement at night. So my hint to you, or my clarification is that transaction will still happen in future. There's no reason to believe that it will not happen. Okay, then a deposit of 40, 41,000 Rand was entered into the cash book and does not appear on the bank statement. Okay, now that's not very clear in terms of when it was entered, will it happen or will not happen. So as clarification, I'll tell you, assume that it will still happen. There's no reason to believe that that transaction will not go through the bank statement in future. Okay, then a trust deposit of 12,606 Rand was erroneously credited to the business account. So who made this mistake? The bank or us? The answer is the bank. So if it's the bank's error, we know it's bank recon. Our error gets fixed on the cash book. Rent paid on 31 October appears on the bank statement. So if it's on the bank statement, it means it did happen we need to go and update our records. Director's salary amounting to 12,500 only appears on the bank statement. So again, did it happen? Yes, it did, it's on the bank statement. So we'll have to go and add it to our side of the records. Okay, and then, so there's two documents that you've got to do, a supplementary cash book, where we put all the transactions that we didn't know about on, and then the bank reconciliation, which will contain all the transactions that we know about, but that will still only happen and go through the bank in future. Okay, so this one, I don't think in general, I don't think this assignment is very difficult. I think it should be rather easy to pass. Don't take it lightly, but it's a very possible assignment. Okay, so let's move on to question two. Let's first go down to the required. You are required to record all the accounting entries in your books of account. Okay, now what does that mean? That means T accounts. So you don't have to do journal batches. You don't have to do financial statements. You don't have to do the whole batch. All that you've got to do is T accounts for everything. Okay, so I'm just going to help you and guide you slightly. So the T accounts that you've got to have to pass this assignment is a trust cash book. Malloy's trust ledger, Mabuza's trust ledger, an investment account, 86.4 investment account, a business cash book, Malloy's business ledger, a fee account, and a VAT account. Those are all the ones that you need. Okay? If you've got less than that, you're going to lose marks. If you've got more than that, yeah, I don't know why. 
Okay. So a question to you are consulted by Mr. Mabuza who's selling his property to Ms. Beloy for 4.2 million. He instructs you to prepare a sale agreement. The essential terms of the sale are. Okay, now let's make a note here. This whole section just gives you info. So at this point, you don't have to enter any amounts into any ledger. It's just info for the background. Some of it will become applicable later, but yeah. We'll go through it as we go. Okay, so Ms. Beloy will pay a deposit of 1 million rand on signature. Okay, that's great. That's info, no transaction there. Ms. Beloy will pay the transfer costs of 340,000, of which 278 is transfer duty, and 3,805 is for disbursements paid on 25 November 2022. So all of it is info, but those disbursements, I want you to highlight this like I did or draw a circle around it and then draw a big arrow all the way down here and go and put it in or mark it between 0.5 and 6 because this transaction actually happens on the 25th of November, but no reference gets made to it again. So I'm scared that you guys are going to forget about it and not enter it into your ledgers by the time you get to 25 November. So highlight that, draw arrows so that you remember to come back to this transaction, okay? You will invest the 1 million deposit in an interest-bearing account for Ms. Beloy's benefit. Ms. Beloy arranged the bond, uh, bond with First Chain Bank for 3.2 million. Okay, happy day. So there's a bunch of info there, no actual transactions except for that one, but we can't enter that now. We've got to wait till we get to that date before we can enter it. Okay, now we get to the actual transactions. So the most key factor in all these transactions is to get your cash book entry right. So if it increases your bank balance, debit your cash book. If it decreases your bank balance, credit your cash book. Already there, you're going to get one mark. So even if you mess up the posting completely, you're going to almost pass this because every transaction, one leg goes into the cash book. Okay. Right, so let's start. On 16 November, you receive two payments by EFT from Ms. Beloy. One million, so that's a cash book entry. That's one payment. And 340,900 and something for the pro forma cost. So the 300 is a second transaction. So there's two transactions there. Then you invest the one million with Absa Bank. Okay, so again, there's a payment from your trust. You've got to receive it in the investment. And then I want to make a note here, they on the mark plan did it other in a different manner. It's all both correct, but in this case, they actually posted that transaction to the client's ledger. So you've got to show where it goes out of the client ledger in the client's ledger as well. So you've got to show the bank transaction, payment from the bank, debit the client, and then where it comes into the investment, you debit the investment and credit the client again. So it's in and out on the client's account, but do show both of those legs because there's a mark for each of them. Okay. Then on the 17th of November, you pay the transfer duty. So there's a cash book transaction there. On the 17th of November, you receive the rates and tax figures and Mr. Mabuza pays 28,200. So there, the moment it says pay, there's a cash book transaction, which you immediately pay the municipality. So there is another transaction. So yeah, you've got one, two transactions. Then on the 19th of November, you receive a bank guarantee from First Strand Bank for 3.2 million. Okay, so this means they only send you a letter to say that we guarantee this amount, we're holding this amount on your behalf. It is not physically received in the bank. That only happens on the date of transfer. Okay, so on the 19th of November, there is no transaction. Okay, then on 25 November, you receive the transfer duty receipt from SARS. So again, we've already paid them. This is just their receipt to say, okay, we've received your money. So it's no actual transaction there, but on the 25th, remember to go back because on the 25th, we paid those disbursements. So that's physically a payment from the trust account towards the disbursements. Okay, then on the 26th, documents get lodged at the deeds office. There's no transaction there. On the 30th, the transfer and bonds are registered. Okay, so everything that happens from now on happens on the 30th. Okay, so first th thing, you close the investment account at ABSA. 
it credits the investment account with 2365. Okay, so that's the debit in the investment account. Now, the credit leg of that must be split between the Fidelity Fund portion, that part, and obviously the balance is then towards the client. So the net of the 23 less the 118 must go to the client's account. Okay, but then it says it's also immediately paid to the Fidelity Fund. So you must reflect that payment in the investment account with the other leg against the Fidelity Fund trust creditor. Okay. And then and receive your firm receives 1,2046 Rand from APSA. So obviously that is the amount that goes out of the investment account, then back into your normal trust account, and then again show the in and out against the client's ledger as well, the client's trust ledger. Okay, then number nine, you receive 3.2. So here we physically receive the guarantee. Okay, so that's a cash book transaction. Then Number 10, you account and pay the seller and the buyer. You also transfer the fees to the business account. Now, okay. that one line equates to about six transactions, which I've worked out. So I'm just going to mention the transactions and you can figure out how to put it in. So the first transaction is you've got to raise a fee. So that's a journal where we show it on the client. We show the fee, we show the VAT. Okay. Then secondly, there's the cash book entry where we transfer our fees from the trust account to the business account. Then there's another trust journal where we set off the fees from the client's trust ledger to the client's business ledger because he's now settled that from his trust funds. Then you've got to do a journal where you transfer the sales price from the buyer to the seller because at this stage the money will lie on the buyer's account, but ultimately we're going to pay out the seller. So you must do a journal of the 4.2 million from buyer to seller to show that the trust funds now moves over to the seller's account. Okay, then you've got to do a cash book payment to the buyer for whatever is left on his account, and you've got to do a cash book payment to the seller for whatever is left on his account. Okay, so that's the six transactions. So raise fee, Cash book entry for the trust to business transfer, trust journal for the set off of the trust ledger to the business ledger, transfer the sales price, do a cash book payment to buyer, cash book payment to sell. Okay, so yeah, again, if we look at it, I'm sure everyone will get a few of the posting transactions correct, but at least if you only even get the cash books correct, you were going to get really close to passing this. So then you've got to be lucky on a few other ones. But this one, definitely not rocket science. I think this is a a question that you can easily do very well in. Okay, let's move on to question three. Okay, so question three, when can a practitioner register as a VAT vendor? Okay, so my note to you there is just go and, so they ask when can a practitioner. So there you guys can go and do some Google on Source's website when you can register. But also comment on when it is compulsory to register. They don't specifically ask it, but you'll see it counts two marks. So mark one is for when you can register. Mark two is for when it is compulsory to register. So I insert both of those details. Okay, describe in detail all the information that must be recorded on a trust receipt. Okay, guys, this is just logic. There's about five things that you enter on a trust receipt. Okay, so trust receipt means Someone walks into your office, he pays you money, and you've now got to give him a receipt to say what or that he paid the money. So obviously, yeah, just think logically. What are you guys going to put on that receipt? It's, it's yeah, I, <laughs> I can't go into it too much, but there's about five or six things on any normal receipt. So you've just got to guess three of them, okay? It's got nothing to do with FICA or whether there's now cash there. It's simply just what you put on a receipt that you give to someone when he gives you money. All right. 3.3, .3, you are required to prepare fully narrated journal entries to record the following, okay? So fully narrated means we must have a debit leg of the entry with a description of the account and amount. We must have the credit leg of the, of the entry um, with the description 
and the amount. And below that, you must have a description of the journal. So you must say this, what the journal does, disbursement, whatever it is. You guys can use your own wording there. As long as whatever your journal description is, explains to the reader of that journal what you are trying to achieve there. Okay. So then it says disbursement towards the payment of Sheriff Alberton for 2,513 Rand on ABX B2 Limited. Okay, now don't let the payment word payment fool you. Okay, a payment was made to Sheriff Alberton. That's not what they're asking here because that would be a cashback transaction. Yeah, they're asking to raise the disbursement. So to raise the disbursement is basically exactly the same as raising a fee. Okay, so use the same methodology for raising a fee and then raise the disbursement. Okay, so don't let the word payment set you off. There's no cash book on this. And then also VAT is not applicable to this transaction. I know sheriffs are VAT registered, so but it's, it's not clear whether you must take VAT or not. VAT is not applicable to this one. Okay. Then 3.4, your correspondent has given you a 20% allowance on fees of 20,000 Rand. Provide for VAT at 15%. Okay, so again, this is basically the same as a fee because it's I've got a corresponding attorney. He's done the work. He now says, OK, you can take a portion of the fee. So the corresponding attorney is my client. So I'm basically going to debit a fee to my client's account, to my correspondent's account. OK, that 20,000 Rand there is exclusive of that. OK, so your fee portion is 20 percent of that. And then you must work out what's that on top of that. And then obviously debit your client with a balance of the fees plus VAT. Okay, so yeah, a few interesting ones here. I think this is also actually very easy marks to get. Okay, question number four for 20 marks. Let's read the required. Record the above transactions fully in your books of account. Okay, now again, fully in your books of account means only have to do T accounts. Okay, you don't have to do... Um, income statements and cash flow analysis and whatever, all that you are required to do is T accounts. You don't have to write out your journals, just do the T accounts. Okay. So in December 2022, your client, Mr. De Brain, instructed you to collect 90,000 Rand owed to him by Miss Mary White. In carrying out the instruction, you charge the instruction fee, 2,000 Rand, XVAT. So very simple fee journal, exactly basically like the ones on top. Pay a tracing agent an amount of 2850. Okay, so pay means it's a cash book transaction. So we have to recover that from the client. It's not our expense. So we've got to allocate the contra leg of that transaction to the client's account. Okay, then pay EFT or receive an EFT of 50,000 Rand from Miss Mary White and charge collection commission of 2,000 Rand X VAT. Okay, so obviously we receive an EFT, so that's a trust cash book transaction, which goes to the client's trust ledger. And then for the collection commission, again, a fee journal, exactly the same as the instruction fee that they mentioned in A. Okay, then number D, it says pay the SARS, the VAT. Okay, so the moment they say pay, it means it's a cash book transaction. Pay the South African Revenue Service the VAT due, and you pay Mr. De Bray. So there's two transactions there because we've got to pay SARS and the balance on Mr. De Bray's account after we take our fees needs to be paid out to him. So there's two payment transactions there. And then transfer the fees due to the business. So again, there's a cash book leg where we transfer physically from the trust bank to the business care bank. And then there's a transfer journal where we set off Mr. Uh, where we set off the client's trust ledger against his business ledger. Okay. So again, I think it's a very easy 20 marks there. Nothing too serious. Okay, moving on to question five. So if we go down question five, what are we expected to do? You are required to draw up an income statement budget and a cash flow forecast for December 2023 in column format, okay? So just to clarify, it says list each income expense separately, okay? So our columns, so we're gonna have 12 columns. So to answer this, it's exactly like the way that I showed it in the lecture. 
So you use that exact format, that's perfect, and you've got to do it for 12 months. So you've got to have 12 periods, the whole calendar year. Okay, so let's just go back and have a read through on that. Um, okay, in preparing your budget and cash flow for the year, so 12 columns there, the following information was received from your accountant. Okay, so monthly expenses. So all of these are very simple. These expenses go into every column. Now, don't at this stage go and populate those numbers through the whole thing because some of them will change. So if you now go and write that 12,000 rand in all 12 of your columns, there might be changes to it which will be addressed further. So just know this is monthly expense. So you don't take that amount divided by 12 and put it in monthly. That is the monthly amount. So salaries and wages every month is 60K. So it's 60, 60, 60, 60. Direct salary 2020, 2020. Okay, so that hopefully clarifies that. And then obviously depreciation. Just remember again, do we physically go to the bank and pay depreciation? No, we don't. So that one doesn't go in the cash flow, only in the budget. Okay, and then simple salaries were increased by 5% in March 2023. That's very simple.